I, I get the impression, I don't jump to the impression, but it creeps up on me, that maybe they don't care about me very much, you know, or perhaps they've even forgotten me. And so uh, I, I, needed, uh, I needed a hint, you know, uh, not God himself, of course, I wouldn't expect that, but I mean, he could have sent down one of those angels, couldn't he? I mean, someone. I mean, he's got millions of them out there, because someone could have come down <laughs> with wings. Yeah, with wings. This must be amazing. And I think about when the Annunciation happened, whatever that was, when that little Jewish virgin was, you know, pottering about and taking her makeup off. <laughs> and suddenly there was a kind of fluttering, and she looked around, and there was a, a six-foot blonde there, all silver, Fabulous hair, like George Clooney. And, uh, and he had wings, that's what that said, really flummoxed her. That's an old word. And, uh, and he said, <laughs> maybe it's not so funny. <laughs> he said, We are not Mary. And she said, I suppose. Yeah, not. How did this not a respectable little virgin? I'm a case of a carpenter down the road. And you, how did you get in here anyway? <laughs> and so all that sort of stuff, was just, all that kind of belief in religion that I had, prepared me. I didn't know, of course. We don't know what fate holds. It prepared me for the great experience of my life, which was to play Doctor Who, where. Everything is a kind of blind faith. There's no physics in Doctor Who. That's a thrilling thing. There's no nod towards physics. We just actually go through time and space in a split second, faster or slower, whatever, however the plot tells us to do. And so all this thing about uh, Jesus walking on water and then especially as the fancy that one of turning water into wine. <laughs> Poor, apparently he was very popular. <laughs> I mean, at, at, at parties and, uh, and then walking walk on the water and then that big thing of feeding 5,000 people with three fishes and two loaves. That's impressive. Two loaves and three fishes for 5,000 people. He not only did that, which impressed me a lot at the time, still does, uh, is that there were 12 baskets full of afters to be picked up. <laughs> 12 baskets, and we're not talking about, you know, little baskets. You know, 2,000 years ago, I happen to know this because I've been watching Channel 4. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those baskets were six feet high, packed with fragments of cod. And, would you ask me a question? <laughs> <laughs> supernatural beings, the irrational impulse in a little village where I live, Tenterton, where obviously all the women, I had a woman say in Warstones the other day, a very old lady, older than me, oh. and she said, um, excuse me, she said, have you got anything about murder? <laughs> and so the guy said, well, yes, he said, we've got thousands of women. Oh, she said, I mean something really grisly. <laughs> Listen, she said, I like grisly and uh, screaming and horror. She said, because my husband died two weeks ago, and uh, Really, I need a bit of a lift. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you think to yourself, glancing around the book, you think, oh, in the Oxfam shops, we are, oh, Muslims, are, seem to be obsessed with crime, don't we? And I suppose this is because that in real life, we have to worry about our health or earning a living or whether our children are happy and so on. But in the other room of, of our imaginations. We want to escape and we don't yeah. want peace on earth to men of goodwill. We want stories about incest, you know, and betrayal and murder and, you know, and hunting and oh, 
slaughter on a big scale, and old ladies are pulling young men. <laughs> it's quite difficult to pull that one off because the audience, the audience is often skeptical about that. <laughs> but it can be done. It can be done. And so we move. So we're in, in, in our imagination. There's no limit to it. It's simply wonderful. And without these irrational impulses, which people condemn, say, Graham used to say to me, you're so irrational, Tom. Um, the thing is, without irrational impulses, there would be there would be no there would be no religion. That's a big irrational impulse, maybe the biggest of them all. There would be no art. The creation of art springs somewhere along the line of, of people seeing things in a different way, which seems irrational. There would be, especially, there would be no love. Would there? What could be more irrational than you know people when they fall in love? I mean, the first thing, you can always tell when someone's in love, often they're trembling from head to foot. But the other thing that I notice is that they always have an idiotic expression on their face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are other signs, but I won't go into that. <laughs> what we have and the cherish at the same time fills us with fear. Finally, of course, it fills us with fear when our own disappearance comes, which is, I imagine, the origin of all religions, all those thousands of gods from the past, where people in the olden days were trying to find an explanation of natural phenomena, in a yes. sense. Religion in those days was the original, the original science and technology, because it explained, it explained thunder, it explained the seasons, by analogy of gods who went down and people up there in the sky. It explained things to us, comforted us, because the idea of our own annihilation, no one has ever experienced death. Well, Jesus did, the Son of God, that's what they say. And, well, he should know. Um, <laughs> because, you know, death is a, a state of unbeing. We can't imagine it. We can't imagine it. We know what the horror of dying in pain might be. And that, that's not much of a laugh either. But uh, otherwise, we're afraid of losing what's precious, life and health. And... So I think that it would be a good idea at this moment to ask Toby to ask me another question. <laughs> I mean, if some fellow came down, you know, paper wings and, uh, and a hump on his back and said to some little Jewish virgin, fear not, Mary, <clears throat> I've got a message for you, say, peace. <laughs> I'm supposed to be six foot three, looking like George Clooney with silver wings. <laughs> we need that familiarity, don't we? I mean, we, I hope you agree with me, because if you do, I must. I'm very vulnerable here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Toby will add to that. Well, no, it's, well, I think you do, so then it's easy to forget that, you know, because you're such a force of personality and because your doctor is so funny as well. That, that, the dramatic moments that you do in Doctor Who are extraordinary, and you're a very fine actor. It's very difficult, it seems to me, uh, that <clears throat> it's very difficult to be very passionate when you're skit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean it in this sense that poverty always struck me as, as a terrible, terrible earache, that you can't stop thinking I'm poor, as I have been in the past. And you know, you wake up in the night and you think, the first thing, you don't think, oh, I wonder does God really exist? You think, Christ, I'm poor. <laughs> and you look out of the window and you see someone poor going by and you think, the buckets are absolutely everywhere. <laughs> Get away from being poor. You can't think about anything else and this is what breaks one's heart. When you think of people who are desperately poor, it's, 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 an abs it's, like, it's akin to hunger, isn't it? It consumes people. Uh, and so therefore, now to be very serious, the moment I met a girl with a few shillings, yeah. oh, <laughs> I was a changed man. <laughs> How did I get that? You might buy a whale.